All right, folks, welcome back. We're glad to have you here at Anchor Bible School. We're excited about the potential that this school has for reaching the world. Not only because of the class, but because we taped this series and we want it to go uh, to the world. And uh, not only on the internet, but also on television broadcast. So we appreciate you being here. It's much easier to tape things with people than to do it in an empty studio. You know, it's difficult to get inspired when uh, you don't have anybody to preach to except for empty chairs. So thank you for coming. We're going to continue studying this chart. Now when chapter 13 ends, and we'll include chapter 14, 1 through 5, how many groups do you have? Two. You have those who worship the image and receive the mark and the number of the name, and then you have those who are standing victorious on Mount Zion, right? But of course the question comes up, what is it that led the two groups to be on one side or the other? Why did one group decide to be on one side and the other group decide to be on the other side? We don't have a clear reason for that in chapter 13. So now we come to chapter 14 and verse 6. What do we have in chapter 14 and verse 6? The three angels' messages. Interesting. Three angels are sent from heaven to preach to the world. And they preach, first of all, they were to fear God, they preached the everlasting gospel, they were supposed to fear God, give glory to Him, because the hour of His judgment has come, and that the world is supposed to worship the Creator. Right? That's the first angel's message. The second angel's message says, folks, if you're in Babylon where, where that is not practiced, get out. See, the three angels' messages are sequential. The first message says, hey, fear God, which incidentally is usually linked with keeping God's commandments. So, fear God, give glory to God, we're in the hour of His judgment, worship the Creator, and then the second angel says, if you're in Babylon where none of those things are done, she's fallen, come out. And then the third angel says, if you don't come out, if you receive the mark of the beast, if you worship the beast and his image, this is what is going to happen. The wrath of God will fall upon you. Do you see the sequence? And so the three angels' messages have the purpose of polarizing the world. Dividing the world into two groups. In other words, ripening the world, if you please. And incidentally, the three angels' messages are accompanied by the latter rain. You know that the latter rain was what matured the harvest and ripened the harvest? Have you noticed what comes immediately after the three angels' message? Jesus is seen seated on a cloud. And there are two harvests that are ripe. Have you noticed that? There's first of all the harvest of the earth. That represents what group? The righteous. That's the first thing that Jesus does, is to separate the righteous. And incidentally, if I might say this, we've usually applied uh, Jesus sitting on the cloud as the Son of Man and having a sickle in His hand. We usually have applied that to the second coming, but technically it's referring to the conclusion of the judgment. Because the, the harvest is separated before Jesus comes. And Ellen White understands it that way. And so the Jesus sitting on the, sick, sitting on the cloud as the Son of Man, with a crown on His head, and with a sickle in His hand, He's going to harvest the earth because the harvest is ripe and the grapes are ripe. Let me ask you, what is it that ripened the harvest and the grapes? The three angels' message. And what accompanied the three angels' message? the latter rain. Are you following me? And so we know now what it is that it divided the two groups. The group in chapter 13 and the group that stands victorious at Mount Zion. We know 
that the three angels' messages polarize the world into two groups. Follow me? Now, you have Jesus, puts in his sickle, harvests the harvest of the earth, the righteous, because the righteous are the first to be judged, and then he puts in his sickle, and he harvests the grapes of the earth, represents the wicked. And then the grapes are thrown into the wine press. And where is the wine press? If you've read Revelation 14, 18 to 20, the wine press is outside the city. Which city? Jerusalem. And who is in Jerusalem? The saints. Literally or spiritually? Spiritually. Because you, when you accept the three angels' message, you are first in Jerusalem spiritually, and then you will be literally. Are you understanding the principle? So in Revelation 14, where it says that you know the, the righteous are inside the city, by the way, it doesn't give the name of the city. But later on, we're going to find that it's Jerusalem citizens of the New Jerusalem. By accepting the, the three angels' message, they become citizens of the New Jerusalem. They're in Jerusalem. Not physically, but spiritually. Outside the city are the grapes, in the wine press. What do you suppose the grapes are doing out there, outside the holy city? Why are they there? On vacation? No! If you go to Joel chapter 3, which is the root prophecy, it speaks about the nations gathering around Jerusalem to attack it. And then it speaks about the wine press there. This comes from Joel chapter 3. So why are the wicked in the wine press outside the holy city? What is their intention? Their intention is to attack and destroy the remnant who are spiritually in Jerusalem. Is this happening worldwide? This is worldwide. Because in Joel it says that the harvest is in the valley of Jehoshaphat. But when you come to Revelation 14, Jesus is said, harvest the earth. So Revelation 14 universalizes what we find in the book of Joel. In Joel it's the valley of Jehoshaphat. In Revelation it is the, the harvest of the earth. The vintage of the earth. In other words, the three angels' messages divide the world into two groups. God's people are safe and sound in spiritual Jerusalem, and the wicked are in the wine press, gathered to attack the city. But you know how chapter 14 ends? It speaks mysteriously about some horses that trample the wine press. Interesting. And the blood spreads splatters up to the horse's bridles. This, folks, is symbolic language. Because we're not talking about literal grapes. Now why the wine press? You know what a wine press is? A wine press, at least the way it used to be, in Italy, is that they would put all the grapes into a big tub, and then people would get in with bare feet and they would trample upon the grapes to make wine. See, now you will not feel tempted to drink wine anymore. <laughs> of course, wine isn't made that way, but that's the way. In some places in Italy, it's still done that way. I understand. Rosanna is from Italy, and I see her saying yes. And what happens when you're trampling the grapes? What happens with your clothing? They are splattered. And what does the wine look like? Blood. Now let me ask you, who is riding those horses that trample the wide press and, and, the, and the blood splatters up to the horses' bridles? You don't know until you get to Revelation 19, where it speaks about Jesus sitting on a white horse, and the armies of heaven are coming with him, and his garments are stained in blood. That is not his own blood, but it is the blood of the wicked because he, it says that he comes to trample the winepress. Are you with me? 
So what happens when the wicked are gathered around God's people to destroy God's people who are in spiritual Jerusalem, those who have received the mark of the beast, who worship the beast, who worship the image of the beast, who, who receive the number of the beast? They're going to gather around God's people according to the book of Revelation with the intention of destroying them, but when they're about to destroy them, Jesus and the armies of heaven will come from heaven and they will trample the winepress and deliver God's people. Amen. So let me ask you, does Revelation 14 end with the final crisis of God's people? It does. With the two groups? Yes. And then you have, do you see there Revelation 15, 2 through 4 on the right hand side? That's the climax. The question is, was anybody victorious over the beast, over his image, over his mark, and over the number of his name? See, it reaches the same climax that chapter, 14, that chapter 13 reached. Are you with me? See, it takes you all the way, all the way to the climax, and then it, it said, uh, John says, inspired by the Spirit, now wait a minute, I still have some things to tell you about what happened before. So let's read Revelation 15 and verses 2 through 4. Revelation chapter 15 and verses 2 through 4. It says there, And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who had the victory over the beast, over his image, over his mark, and over the number of his name. Is that in the third angel's message? A warning about all that? Of course. It's in the third angel's message. Are there a group that are victorious? Yes. Where are they standing? They're standing on the sea of glass, having what? Harps of God. And what do they sing? The song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb saying. Now let me ask you, is that the same group that we saw in Revelation 14, 1 through 5? Yes or no? Yes. So in other words, they're going to stand victorious twice, right? No. It's the same victory dance. But what has happened? What John has done, he's taken us all the way to the end, Revelation 14, 1 to 5, and then he's going to tell us, hey, I want to tell you how those people got onto Mount Zion. And I want to tell you what happened with uh, those who worship the beast in his image. So then he takes you back to the three angels' message. He says, this is what divided the earth into two, two groups. The three angels' message made some people mad at, at them, and other people accepted them. And those who got angry, they received the mark of the beast, and worshipped the beast, and received the, and, and, and the image of the beast. Whereas those others, they gained the victory over the beast, over his image, over his mark, and over the number of his name. Are you following me? And so then Revelation 15, it takes you, as we're going to notice in a few moments, 15, 2 to 4, that's the climax of chapter, four, chapter 14. In other words, verses 2 through 4 of chapter 15 really belongs with chapter 14. It's the climax of chapter 14. Now John is going to tell you Inspired by God's Spirit, he's going to say, now wait a minute. Hmm. I still have a few things to tell you about things that happened before they stood victorious. So now he's going to go back and he's going to describe the close of probation. Is he taking you further forward? Do you see the chart there? Yeah. See, Revelation 12 has the whole picture. 13 begins with the Old Testament. Fourteen tapes you to the time when the three angels' messages begin to pro be proclaimed, all the way to the, to, to the victorious group. Chapter 15 takes you back. Let me ask you, will God's people stand on Mount Zion before the close of probation? No. Of course not. So chapter 15 is going to take you to the time when probation closed. It's taking you back to when the moment when the three angels' messages end. And as we already studied, 
The temple is filled with smoke. The temple being what? The most holy place. And no one can what? No one can enter. Let me ask you, has probation closed at this point? Have the three angels' messages done their work and divided the whole world into two groups? Yes. So you see, do you see it's taking it a little bit a little bit further forward? The three angels have finished their message. Isn't this fascinating? How, the, how when you understand the structure, you know exactly where to fit everything. If you don't, you say, now wait a minute, how can they be on Mount Zion before the close of probation? You know, how can they be victorious in chapter 14 before the three angels' messages are proclaimed? The fact is they're not. The fact is that you have this phenomenon of taking you all the way forward, then back. Then forward, and not as far back. And then forward, and not quite as far back. Until finally when you get to the last part of the book, the first stages are totally forgotten. So in chapter 15, takes you to the moment when the three angels' messages end. Is that clear? Yes. And then the next chapter, chapter 16, after probation closes, after a short period of time, what is poured out? The plagues. Is that taking you a little bit further forward than the close of probation? Yes. It's taking you a little further. And chapter 16 gives you all of the seven plagues. However, there are three plagues that are particularly important for God's people. We're going to notice in our study this afternoon or tomorrow, depending on how fast we go. <laughs> we might have to have two sessions tomorrow, but anyway. <laughs> We're going to notice in our study tomorrow that when you, when you get to the plagues, the first four plagues, God's people are in jeopardy. I call them jeopardy plagues. In other words, God's people, the lives of God's people are in danger. And the wicked are filled with rage. But when you get to plagues five, six, and seven, those are called deliverance plagues. Because during those three plagues, God's people are no longer in danger. In fact, when the fifth plague of darkness falls, the, the politicians of the world, the civil rulers of the world, are going to wake up. And the multitudes that have been deceived by counterfeit religion are going to wake up. And they're going to say, you guys deceived us. And their rage for God's people is going to be forgotten. Like after the millennium with the devil. With the multitude. See, first of all, they're focused on the holy city after the millennium. To destroy those who are inside the city. But when, when God shows them who is the real guilty party, they turn on the devil. Same is going to happen before the millennium. The people who go to church now and they just glorify their preachers and they say, oh, this is so wonderful, this futurism, that we're going to heaven before the rapture. Oh, we can have our cake and we can eat it too. Isn't this wonderful? And they preach a prosperity gospel and just make yourself rich. God want you, wants you to be rich in this world. And He wants you to be psychologically happy. And all those who have soothed the feathers of people, Someday they will have to render an account. And they will not render it only to God. They will render it to their religious leaders. To the, the people that they deceived will turn against them. That's a drying up of the Euphrates. We're going to study that. Are you catching the picture? It's a serious thing to be a preacher. Very serious. Because God will hold us more accountable than anyone else. Because where great light is given, much is demanded. And so if there's any preachers out there where your focus is having a big ministry and getting lots of money 
and being very popular, think twice. The popularity and the money will last now, but reckoning day will come. And it will be not be God who will do it. It will be those who most admired them who will do the work. Amazing. So you have the first four plagues, jeopardy plagues. We'll study this. And the last three plagues are deliverance plagues. Because in the last three plagues, once the darkness hits and God's people are in light, oh, the wicked multitudes, and God is going to show His law in the heavens, and He's going to show that the Sabbath was still binding. Psalm 50 tells us that. Then the wicked are going to say, you told us they were the bad guys. Now we know who the real bad guys are. And so the rage will no longer be focused on God's people. God's people will be, all, all be safe. In fact, at that point, we'll have the special resurrection of those who died in the message of the third angel. And God's living saints will be glorified. And so you have the, all of the plagues in chapter 16. But then you'll notice that there's something significant about plagues number 6 and 7. And so in chapter 17, God through John says, now wait a minute, I already gave you all of the plagues up to number 7, but I have something to tell you more about number 6 and 7. And so in chapter 17 and 18, what He does is He goes back and He, and he amplifies plagues number 6 and 7. Are you following me? And you know, this won't make a lot of sense to you right now because we haven't studied it. But in Revelation 17, he's going to actually explain the moment when the waters are dried up on the harlot. That's plague number six. And when the kings turn against the harlot, it says the kings that cooperated with the harlot, they will hate the harlot and they will make her desolate and naked and they will burn her with fire. That's a way of saying that they're going to really be mad at her. <laughs> so they better be very careful about linking up with religion because it will be a serious matter, a serious thing. And so in chapter 17 you have an amplification of the sixth and seventh plagues. And then God in His mercy, do you notice there where it says 18, 1 through 5, flashback warning? After describing plagues number 6 and 7 from a religious, pers religious political perspective in chapter 17 and from a religious economic perspective in chapter 18, because chapter 18 emphasizes commerce. Chapter 17 emphasizes religion. Are you following me? After you have the picture in chapter 17 of the 6th and 7th plagues that are going to fall without mercy, then you have chapter 18, 1 through 5. It's the loud cry. Is the loud cry given during the plagues or is it given before the close of probation? So why is it there? The reason why is because God wants to say, listen, the plagues are going to fall on Babylon. Doesn't the, doesn't the loud cry say, come out of her, my people, lest you partake in her sins and you receive her plagues? So God, after, after portraying this harlot who fornicates with the kings, and is full of the blood of the saints, God says, I've got to warn everybody, I've got to insert a warning. And so in chapter 18, verse 1 through 5, he says, these plagues are going to fall on Babylon. Babylon, get out! Are you with me? It takes you back to warn people that when these plagues come, make sure you're not there. Because those plagues are going to fall upon Babylon. Is that making sense? And then you come to chapter 18 and verses 6 through 24. This is the fall of Babylon from an economic perspective. See, we live in a world 
We live in a world where we have a global economy. And someday that global economy, that Babylonian economy, is going to collapse. And that is portrayed in Revelation 18. The demise of the union of church and state is portrayed in chapter 17. The demise of the global economic system is in chapter 18. And then, this is interesting, after chapter 18 you have the global collapse of the economy. Do you notice to the right hand side of the line there, 19, 1 through 10? God's people are in heaven again. <laughs> now we've got a problem. How can God's people be in heaven in chapter 19 verses 1 through 10 if Jesus doesn't come on the white horse until Revelation 19, 11 to 21? <laughs> Are you understanding my question? The second coming is in Revelation 19, 11 to 21. But God's people are in heaven in verses 1 through 10. So how can they be in heaven before the seventh plague? <laughs> the answer is very simple, folks. Revelation 19, 1 through 10 is the climax of chapter 18. When everything collapses, after that God will have a people who stand victorious with Him. But then John says, now wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. I still have to tell you something about the seventh plague, which by the way is the second coming of Jesus. And so then, in chapter 19, 11 to 21, he takes you back to describe the second coming of Christ, coming on a white horse with the armies of heaven. Is that making sense to you? Amen. It's amazing. And you know, do you know where I got the idea to study this structure this way? From the Spirit of Prophecy. Because Ellen White, I don't think Ellen White sat down to do this. I don't know of any chart that she had. But I'll tell you one thing, the Holy Spirit told her exactly how to put it in order. And when you read the book Great Controversy, folks, it is amazing. There is no, there's nil possibility that someone with a two and a half year, two and a half year primary education could have put things in the order that they are in in the book Great Controversy. It's spectacular. And I tell you, as one that has really studied it. And yet people today, they say, oh, don't give out the great controversy because it might offend someone. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. Might offend someone, they say. Well, I suppose God should have told Stephen not to offend Saul of Tarsus. <laughs> you know what? If something offends someone, it's because it hit a raw spark. I have a church member, I have a church member who really got angry at me when I, when I preached the Genesis series the first time. She came with her husband, she was a Roman Catholic. When I spoke about the beast, she quit coming to church, to the series. And she would come once in a while on Sabbath, but she looked at me I mean, if looks could kill, I'd be dead right now. She was not a happy camper. And so some members were saying, Pastor Borsi, you shouldn't have spoken so, so strongly. You know? And I don't, think I, was, I don't think I was obnoxious. I just presented the biblical evidence. She wasn't happy. But the Holy Spirit put it in there. And it worked on her. And to make a long story short, today she is one of the most active members at Fresno Central Church. Amen. And you know what? A couple of years ago she sent me a card apologizing for all of the looks. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. And, and thanking me for preaching that sermon. 
So just because something makes people mad doesn't mean that it's all bad. Because, because Stephen made a lot of people mad. But the result was the Apostle Paul. Plant the seed and let God do the work. Don't start saying, well, if I say it this way, it might get offended. No. Pray to the Lord that the Lord will show you how to say it and then say it. And leave the consequences with God. Because ultimately, the buck stops with Him. Or I guess you would say the pound stops with Him. <laughs> the crusade, no, you don't have crusados anymore, right? In Brazil? Is that, what's your currency? Oh, okay. They used to have the Cruzeiro. You can tell what century I'm from. <laughs> so in Revelation chapter 19, verse 11 to 21, you have the seventh plague, the second coming of Jesus, and He comes to trample the winepress. Let me ask you, is this the same climax that we reached in Revelation 14, 18 to 20? The winepress? Yeah. Now you know, now listen carefully, now you know who's riding the horses. Revelation 14 doesn't tell you who's riding the horses that trample the winepress. Revelation 19 does. It tells you that, that the Word of God is, it on, is on the horse. And the armies of heaven are coming, and they're coming to trample the winepress. And that's why the garments of Jesus are stained in blood. And then, you come to the right-hand side of the line. At the very top of the chart. See, you have these four perspectives, right? That we studied today. What is the first perspective on the extreme right hand side? Satan and the earth. And then you have Revelation 21 and 2, events at the beginning of the millennium. 20 verse 3, the first half of the verse, during. 20 verse 3, the last half of the verse, after. Before, during, and after. And the perspective is Satan and the earth. Then you have the view of the saints. Chapter 20, verse 4, the beginning. Chapter 20, verses 5 and 6, during. And chapter 20, 7 through 10, after. Then, even though it's not there, you have a view of the wicked. In that blank space, you want to put wicked there. Revelation 20, 11 has the beginning. Remember the white throne? Revelation 20, 12 is during the dead standing before God. And Revelation 20, verse 13 through 21, verse 1, after. And then you have the fourth outline and it describes the events after. The, uh, it says there that the holy city descends from heaven like a bride adorned for her husband. And then you have all the description of what life will be like with the Lord. He'll be with God's people. No more tears, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more crying. And then at the end it describes that the overcomers are in the city and it tells you what were the sins that were committed that were in the books that condemned the wicked and they're cast into the lake of fire. And then at the very top of the chart, you have a new heavens and a new earth. So what has Revelation 12 through chapter 22 done? It has taken you through the broad sweep of salvation history from the times of Babylon all the way to the new heavens and the new earth. Step by step. It's amazing. Now, let's go to Revelation 11, 18. We're finished with the chart. It took us one and a half classes to do the chart. <laughs> Revelation 11, 18, in our remaining time. And uh, I actually want to begin at verse 15. Now those of you who were at prayer meeting, you heard some of this. You received the handout. 
So this will be a review for you. But I want to give you another example of the importance of understanding the literary structure. Revelation 11, beginning with verse 15. You're acquainted with the seven trumpets, right? The seventh in the series takes you to the time of the coming of Jesus. Right? When the seven trump, seventh trumpet sounds, Jesus takes over the kingdom. Let's read it. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. Is that the time when Jesus comes to take over the kingdom? Yeah. Seventh trumpet. Verse 16, And the twenty-four elders that, who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, we give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is, and who was, and who is to come. Now listen to the tense of the verb. Because you have taken your great power and reigned. So does God, does Jesus, along with His Father, take over the kingdoms of this world and reign at the moment of the seventh trumpet? Yes. That's the second coming of Jesus. Now yesterday we studied that shortly before the seventh trumpet sounds, what's going to happen? The mystery of God is going to be finished. What is the mystery of God? It's the preaching of the gospel. In the end time it's the preaching of the three angels messages. So shortly before the seventh trumpet sounds, which is the seventh trumpet is the second coming of Jesus, the mystery of God is going to be finished. No one knows how long before, because we have no more time prophecies. The mystery of God will be finished, probation will close. In Revelation 15 it's explained by saying that the temple in heaven is opened to let the plague angels out, the temple is filled with smoke, nobody can go in anymore. Probation is closed. But listen carefully, after probation closes, you're still going to be on earth for the plagues. So there is a period between the close of probation and the second coming of Christ. Now, let's go to verse 18. Verse 18. This verse actually gives you the summary of the rest of Revelation. It is not, this verse is not the conclusion of the seventh trumpet. This verse is going to take you back and it's going to tell you the events that took place from the times that the nations were getting angry till after the millennium. Now notice that there are five events in this verse, and it summarizes or sketches the last half of Revelation. It is the outline of the last half of Revelation. What is the first event here? The nations were angry. The nations were angry. Is that talking about something that happens before the close of probation or after the close of probation? Before. It's before. You say, how do you know that? Well, you know, it's interesting that that word angry that is used there is used in only one other verse in Revelation. Revelation 12, 17. In Revelation there are other words for angry, but this word in Revelation 11, 18 is used in only one other verse, Revelation 12, 17. When the nations are angry, who are they angry at? It's not saying, when it says the nations were angry, it's not emphasizing that, you know, uh, Syria doesn't like Israel. 
That's not, that's not the nations were angry. The nations were angry at God's people. Now let me ask you, in Revelation where is that described? The anger of the nations against God's people. How about Revelation 12? Does Revelation 12 describe the anger? Hmm. He wants to kill the child, then he wants to kill the woman, and then he wants to kill the remnant. How about Revelation 13? Are the nations angry there? The beast persecutes the saints. And then the beast that rises from the earth, he imposes the mark of the beast and tells people to worship on pain of death. And then in chapter 14 you have this warning message, the three angels' message. And after the message is proclaimed, the wicked are gathered around the city to destroy God's people. So where is the anger of the nations described? In Revelation 12, 13, and 14. Now let's know, are you with me? Now notice the next point. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. That's God's wrath. When does God's wrath come? Before or, the close, before or after the close of probation? after. So is the wrath of the nations taking place in post-probationary time? Yes. yes it is. And where in Revelation is the wrath of God described? In Revelation 15, let's notice the, the, the words that are used, Revelation chapter 15, and verse 1. And by the way, verse 1 is, is, uh, is kind of like a parenthetical statement. It says, Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. So when is the wrath of God poured out? In the plagues. Right? So probation closes in chapter 15, chapter 16 the plagues are poured out which is the wrath of God, chapter 17, 18, and 19 further describe the 6th and 7th plagues, and what is the next event in the sequence in Revelation 11? It says, and the time of the dead that they should be judged. Which dead? The wicked. You say, now wait a minute, the wicked? Sure. What happens after the wrath of God is poured out in the plagues? The millennium begins. And what happens during the millennium? The wicked are judged. So there you have chapter 20. Are you with me? What is the next item? The time of the dead that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets, and the saints. So what does God do? The time comes for the judgment of the dead, the wicked dead, but at the same time what happens with God's people? They're rewarded when Jesus comes. And so you find in Revelation it says, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to each according to his work. So, so the next two events have to do with rewarding the wicked by taking them to heaven, and judging the wicked, ju excuse me, ju uh, giving the reward to the righteous and taking them to heaven, and then judging the wicked who are left behind. And then what's the next event? It says, and you should destroy those who destroy the earth. When does that take place? After the millennium. When the wicked are thrown into the lake of fire. 
So what do we have in Revelation 11 verse 18? We have the summary statement that introduces the last half of the book. If you don't realize that, you'll be all messed up. Because chapter 15, chapter uh, um, 11 and verses 15 to 17 describe the second coming. And then verse 18 takes you back. It says, now I'm going to give you the summary of the rest of the book. And then, listen to this, and then in verse 19 God is going to give you the starting point for the, la for the last part of the book. And what is the starting point? It's in 1119. 1119. 1119 does not come after verse 18. Unless you believe that the investigated judgment takes place after God destroys the wicked. <laughs> Are you understanding me? Unless you believe that the judgment takes place after the plagues. Verse 19 takes you back to 1844. Takes you back to 1844. And what happens in verse 19? See, Revelation 11, 19 is the introduction to the rest of the book. 18 gives you the summary of the events. Chapter 11, verse 19 gives you the starting point for the key historical events of the last half of the book. Is this making sense? And what is it that verse 19 says? Then... And when he says then, it's because it's being shown to him afterwards. Then, the temple of God was opened in heaven. Which temple? The word temple here is the Greek word naos, which in Revelation is used 16 times, and it always refers to the most holy place. So the naos is opened in heaven, and what is seen? The Ark of His Covenant was seen in His temple. So, when the Ark of the Covenant is seen, is it still possible to be saved? Does God want His people to enter the temple if the temple is open and the Ark is seen? What does God want us to see when He shows the Ark of the Covenant? Let me ask, when, when was the Ark of the Covenant seen in the religion of Israel? On the Day of Atonement. Do you know what the purpose of the Day of Atonement was? To divide humanity into two groups. Right? The Day of Atonement was to separate the righteous from the wicked. So what is the starting point for the last half of the book of Revelation? The opening of the heavenly temple to judge the world, to determine who is on one side and who is on the other side. And so it says, Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, the ark of His covenant was seen in His temple, that is in the most holy place, and there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, an earthquake, and great hail. And incidentally, verse 19, as we noticed in a previous study, gives you the beginning and the ending point. It gives you the moment when the series in the last half of Revelation begins, and it gives you also when the series ends. Can you think of another verse where you have these same phenomena, lightnings, noises, thunderings, earthquake, and hail? The seventh plague. So this verse gives you the starting point and the ending point. Let's just read that verse, Revelation 16 and verse 17. It says there, Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, 
and a loud voice, so do you hear voices here? Yes. A loud voice came out of the temple of heaven. Is that the same temple that was opened in 1119? Same word. From the throne saying what? It is done. So when the temple opens, that's the beginning. Here, the voice comes from the temple and says what? It, it could be translated, it is finished. Verse 18. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings and there was a great what? Is that the same thing we find in 1119? Yes. As has not occurred since men were on the earth. And you say, well what about, what about the, the hail? Well, notice verse 21. And great hail from heaven fell upon men. So what does 1119 do? 1119 says the main emphasis from 1119 on is going to be the work in the most holy place. And this work in the most holy place will end when God says, it is done. And the same phenomena that are mentioned in 1119 are then mentioned in Revelation 16 in the last several verses. So you also have to connect texts in Revelation with one another. Because, because Revelation is built on a pattern of repetition. So if it's built on a pattern of repetition, then you have to look for the repetition to enlighten what is said earlier in the book. Are you following me or not? So, so what I'm saying is that Revelation is a very intricately organized book. There's no human mind that could have devised this. It's just, it's just too complex. And you know, you might say, well, it's really nice to know all these things, but isn't it enough just to love Jesus? I believe that there's a lot of people that are going to be in heaven that didn't know any of this. They love Jesus. But you know what? We are a people that are going to live through these things. This is a different generation. You see, people who have died during probationary time, it's a different ball game. Because they didn't live through this. And you know, uh, there's going to be a special resurrection. Just to give you an example, there's going to be a special resurrection of those who died understanding the, the message of the third angel. Why would God resurrect those individuals who understood the message of the third angel? There's a very specific reason why He doesn't resurrect everybody else who died in the Lord before that. You see, those who died before that, they're going to be raised once Jesus is above the earth. Read, read uh, Great Controversy 635 to 638. There you have all of the sequence. The, the righteous who died before the third angel's message was proclaimed, those individuals are going to resurrect after the second coming when Jesus is above the earth. But those who embraced and understood the third angel's message are going to resurrect in a special resurrection when the voice of God delivers His people from death. Amen. When the 144,000 are glorified, those who died in the message of the third angel are going to resurrect in a special resurrection. You say, why would they resurrect? And why not the ones who died before? Do you know why? Because the ones that died before would not have the foggiest idea what's happening. Right? Because, listen, listen folks, when, when they resurrect, there's still going to be some events. The fifth, sixth, and seventh plagues are going to be happening. And they didn't understand any of this. So if God resurrected them, they, 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 they would resurrect. They, what's all this? But when God's people resurrect, if they die before the coming, before these events happen, they will know exactly what's transpiring at that moment. That's why God resurrects them. Because they understood, even though they died before, they understood everything involved in the last half of Revelation. 
and they will stand with the 144,000 and understand exactly what is happening. Is that making sense? So, the bottom line is that the book of Revelation is a complex book. <laughs> and it's a beautiful book. And it's a book that we need to know now. Previous generations didn't need to know all of these things. But we do. Because we live in a different period. You can't just say, oh, I just love Jesus. Because if that's the case, why did God even give the book of Revelation? Why did He give Daniel? Because He knew that we needed it for this time of history. And that's why the devil has distracted the church and saying, no, 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 just preach that Jesus loves you, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And no, no, don't talk about prophecy, don't, don't use Ellen White, you know, don't, uh, don't scare people. You know, just preach to me from the Gospels. It's all going on. Seventh-day evangelicals. Because we've gone astray from our sanctuary message, and we've gone astray from our prophetic message. And believe me, folks, our sanctuary message and our prophetic message has power. Because both of those things are the world view of the Adventist church. It brings everything together in a whole. And when people see the whole, they say, this makes sense. Now I understand everything. There are no loose ends. I understand how everything fits together when they see Adventism as it truly is. And people are looking for a worldview that makes sense. Because there's so much senselessness going around. People want something that gives meaning, something that gives structure to their life, something that gives hope to their future. And Revelation is a revelation of hope. A revelation of hope. And God has called us and has delivered this wonderful message to us to deliver to the world. What a tremendous privilege we have. And what an awesome responsibility we have after coming to Anchor Bible School. Amen. May God use us in a powerful way. Alright. Don't leave. We're taking a group picture. <laughs> so come up to the stage. Come up to the stage. We want to take that picture now. Uh, we want everybody in. It doesn't matter what you look like. How you're dressed, everybody knows that you're in a class and that only the instructor, instructor puts a suit on. So just come up here, it won't take very long. Uh, by the way, let's plan to meet at 2.30, will that work? 2.30.